Hello, and welcome to this reflection video. This week, we've seen that urban water management is key to ensure a safe and healthy environment for cities and their citizens. Ensuring a health and safety implies very large responsibilities for governmental bodies. But what have we learned about how citizens and other stakeholders could engage in such a responsible task? Let's start by asking Professor Hub Reinhardt. Yes? Hello, Hub. How are you? Hola, Pablo. How is it going? Hola, ¿cómo estás? Muy bien. <laughs> So, Hoop, what are the main messages that we've learned during this model? This week we uh, learned uh, uh, a number of things, and uh, specifically uh, for the case in Amsterdam with mm -hmm. Waternet, what we've seen there that we uh, need and can involve citizens uh, to create uh, solutions for water uh, challenges in the uh, urban environment. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do that, uh, we um, achieve two things, that is that we um, well, create plans that are supported by the local uh, people, uh -huh. uh, but also that we can include their uh, creative ideas and uh, in this way we can make solutions that are really sustainable and accepted in the uh, local context. Okay, yeah. so this is now you, you're talking about Amsterdam, which is a very specific context? Yeah. But what about other places in the world? Yeah, well, we have uh, been also uh, uh, learning about uh, uh, Asia, China. Uh -huh. um, in these uh, um, conditions you know, or in these countries, uh, we see that a national uh, government takes a lead. For instance, in the concept of Spawn City, a, a national initiative to create solutions for uh, uh, urban water problems. And um, there the national government takes the lead, yeah. uh, but in the implementation, local governments and companies and other institutions at the local level uh, uh, follow that and implement the solutions. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so how can, how can citizens and other entities uh, get in, engaged in, uh, in the creation of yeah. uh, urban water management uh, policies? Yeah, so uh, worldwide what we see is that there is an increase of the problems in relation to climate change mm -hmm. and also uh, the water uh, problems in the urban environment associated to that. Mm -hmm. And um, that's one phenomenon which is uh, really taking place. Uh -huh. uh, the second thing which is um, um, also taking place is the involvement and the awareness of the, uh, the people in the local uh, environment. They know about climate change and they know more and more about the impact of that on their local uh, environment. And by that uh, there is an increasing uh, um, participation and also a willingness of the, of the citizens to think and co-create solutions for their own environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what we have learned is that it is very much dependent on the socio-cultural context, mm -hmm. what type of solutions can be uh, found for yeah. uh, coping with water challenges in the urban environment, but also uh, to what extent uh, different stakeholders can take a role in that, either the national government or the citizens. So uh -huh. this is very much uh, social cultural context dependent. Okay, social cultural context. That's very interesting. Actually, what we're going to do now is we're going to go and ask some young researchers from very different places in the world. That is very different social cultural contexts. Are we going to ask them uh, how um, in their cities or in their countries um, citizens get engaged in the co creation processes of urban water management policies? Let's do it. So the first person that I'm going to interview is Wei Shan, who is from Taiwan. Hi, Wei Shan. 
How are Hi. you? Hello. Oh, good. How you? Are you? How's it going? Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. So um, you're from Taipei. Yes. Yeah? Yes. And I know that in Taipei, uh, one of the big problems is extreme rainfall. Uh, yes. I I think it's higher than 2,000 millimeters per year. Per year, yeah. Um, so I would like to ask you if you know about any example of uh, citizens uh, getting involved. Uh, in into tackling this issue about uh, extreme rainfall. Well, in the past, there were only a uh, government and knowledge institute involved mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. designing and implementing solutions against uh, extreme uh, rainfall. But since 2015, uh, Taipei City has a new project called uh, participatory budgeting for okay. the city of Taipei, mm -hmm. which involves uh, citizens. Yeah. So how how the, this, does this budgeting work? So then. Uh, uh, the Taipei City promotes that uh, citizens can bring up yeah. uh, urban problems at the micro level, so that like, uh, for example, streets, community, neighborhoods, and then uh, they can uh, co-develop the budget with the government mm -hmm. for these urban problems, and also uh, design the solutions together and implement it uh, at the micro uh, level. All right. So, so how has this, this um, uh, program evolved so far since 2015? So uh, from 2015 and 2016 to 2016, yeah. they have a trial. Okay. And in 2016, the government uh, learned that uh, uh, the operational procedure for this budgeting is too complicated. And so in 2016, they uh, simplified and also improved the ICT infrastructures. And they hope by doing that, then the citizens can uh, be involved even more and uh, easier. All right, so you could say that the government of Taipei is learning by doing, right? Because they tried it once and now they're trying it again with an improved version of it. Yeah, definitely. And they will refactor every year and improve every year. Also. Okay, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. Yeah, no problem. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you too. Goodbye. Yeah. I'm sitting now with Martijn van Staveren, who's a PhD student who works in urban flood management. Uh, so, if I'm true, part of your research uh, goes into Delta cities, mm -hmm. right? So, could you tell us about the what kind of challenges Delta cities face in terms of urban flood management? Uh, yes. Uh, well, deltas are uh, low-lying areas, mm -hmm. so from that perspective, they are already in a risk of uh, flooding. Mm -hmm. But especially urban areas have higher risks eh, because there is often... Uh, high population density, uh, high economic uh, built-up value. Mm -hmm. uh, so in case flooding takes place, lots of economic damage and uh, human casualties can occur. All right. So do you have, like, I guess that you might, you could tell us about some kind of example about how government and citizens uh, face or like look for solutions for this high risk? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are uh, many examples that you can uh, can highlight. Um, mm -hmm. But for example, uh, one of the countries where I have been working in Bangladesh, uh, there is a, a flood early warning system project. Okay. And that project deals with uh, improved uh, information management. So the central government in Bangladesh tries to provide early warnings to uh, to local residents, but they also ask those residents to provide information about uh, increasing water levels so that they can better. Uh, yeah, see where uh, where disasters might might happen. Okay, so it's like a double way of communication. The government yes. is talking, but also the citizens are can provide input to this project. Yes, it it comes with its own uh, challenges, of course. But yeah. at least the idea there is to really try to combine these uh, different information sources. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. The next researcher we're going to talk to is Delaram who is a PhD student from Iran. Am I right? Yeah. Hi. Hi How is it going? Fine. So, um, Iran is a country that has been going through very important water scarcity problems, yeah. no? including some uh, water crisis. Yeah. So, could you tell me how this applies to your city? Uh, yeah, so I come from Tehran, the capital. It's a yeah. metropolitan, so a lot of water demand. Um, the, this demand is supplied through mainly through five reservoirs which are um, through building the dams and the rivers but that's not enough to supply all the need of the city so around 30 percent of the water demand comes from uh, the groundwater and in the recent years because of population growth and also because of uh, insufficient rainfalls 
uh, the the reservoirs do not have enough water, so um, there is more stress on the uh, water consumption from the under uh, from the groundwater. Okay, so what are the in which way has the relationship between the government and the citizens evolved through this crisis? Um, so uh, the government uh, put some regulations on groundwater consumption. Okay. Uh, before it was allowed for the citizens to uh, have their own water wells and supply their own demand, but now uh, it's uh, it's very restricted, and uh, the province water company develops uh, construct those water wells and then pump out the water and then provide it th uh, to the citizens. So now it's. Uh, arranged more centrally. Okay, so you could say that the process has been centralized. Yeah, yeah. All right. Indeed, yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, thanks. Now, thanks. from Iran, what we're going to do is we're going to be make a big jump and visit uh, Brazil, uh, hand by hand with uh, Laura. Hi, Paula. How? How are you doing? Good, how are you? So, uh, g let's get you in the frame. So, um, Brazil is a country that uh, has undergone very big, uh, important growth economically, and also it has been uh, going through a process of urbanization. Um, so, has there any environmental challenge uh, appeared through through this uh, evolution? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I think that environmental challenge that is a consequence for urbanization is pollution of water bodies. Okay. Because we we don't have water scarcity as Iran, for instance, uh -huh. but we do have such a large concentr uh, population concentrated in urban areas that, that reduces the availability per capita and also impacts on the quality of the water. Okay. So I'd say we have a big challenge regarding water mm -hmm. pollution. So, and, and in this case, which are the main actors that uh, are involved in the management of urban water? Well, the municipality is the responsible for the urban wastewater treatment. Mm -hmm. Then you have the state government that is um, responsible for managing the reservoirs, but also to make sure that there is vegetation around the water bodies, that the vegetation that protects the, the water body to guarantee the quality. And also maybe some NGOs that work on the, um, the reforestation of these areas. And... Yeah. So, could you tell me, like, is there any cl a clear way in which citizens are getting involved in this case, in the um, um, co-creation of uh, water, urban water management? Yeah, in my opinion, there is not much involvement of the citizens. Okay. So, I think we kind of lagging, lagging behind in the co-creation mindedness. Okay. Are you optimistic? You think it's gonna? I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I All think right. Well, I wish I, I wish the best to it. Yeah. Me Thank too. you very much no for problem. your time. Thank you. And uh, see you around. Yeah, see you. Now I am sitting down with PhD student Kevin Raporst, who is in the landscape architecture department doing uh, research on collaborative design approaches. And one of his case studies looked at the mm. rebuild by design competition, which took place in the east coast of the United States, uh, looking for a uh, an improved urban resilience against floods and hurricanes. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you, Kevin, how familiar were American citizens with public participation uh, before this competition? Mm. Well, actually, the, the phenomena of, of uh, social organization and grassroots movement, uh, also political activism, uh, and thus the, the NIMI effect are, are uh, quite important aspects of American society. So most local stakeholders were already quite familiar with collaborative Approaches. All right. So then, what made this collaborative approach special? Mm. Well, with Rebuild by Design, they used it as a means to to make an inventory of local knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, preferences, uh, political sensitivities, uh, in in order to come up with with innovative design uh, solutions. Well, in the past, this collaborative approach was mostly used to minimize public resistance to okay. spatial plans. Of yeah. course. Then uh, I have one last question for you. Um, if we're talking about flood management and public participation, mm -hmm. I gotta ask it, like, were there Dutch designers mm -hmm. participating in this? Well, yeah, Rebuild by Design was really a, a Dutch endeavor, that, so a lot of Dutch designers went there. Um, but, but even they realized that when they came there, the notion of, of flood safety is, is not as uh, self-evident as it is in mm -hmm. the Netherlands. So they had to make quite an effort to, to persuade local stakeholders that, that, that 
It's flood safety is quite an important okay. aspect. Yeah. So we're talking about Dutch designers stepping into a new, unfamiliar um, social cultural context. Mm, yeah, definitely. All right, that's yeah. what we've been talking about for this entire model. Mm, nice. So thank you very much. <laughs> hey, no problem. <laughs> So now you've heard about different cases of urban water management around the world. Not only you've seen that each region faces completely different challenges, but also you can conclude that with different social cultural contexts also comes the different roles that the different actors that coexist in the city, such as governments, NGOs, um, private companies and citizens, can and will take in managing urban water.